Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for taking uh, time out of your busy day to uh, join here uh, today, where we're going to talk about uh, running unattended or lights out um, machining. Um, as Derek said, please feel free to uh, to put your questions in uh, the question area, and we'll definitely make sure that uh, that we get some time to uh, to dig into some of, of those uh, questions. So. Um, this is going to be the only bulletin you're going to see in this uh, PowerPoint presentation. But uh, I want to start with a quick little intro because I think that that is important who I am when it comes to, uh, especially when we start talking technical like, like this here. Um, and then I kind of like want to wrap it around kind of three uh, different uh, kind of subjects. So, um, so one question when you start talking about run when you want to run unattended is how do we pile a bunch of parts uh, on our tables or in our fixtures and, and dare to hit cycle start and maybe maybe walk home. Um, and another thing, while that is happening, how do we avoid, you know, crashing into our vice jaws or with our holders? Um, I call it No Sparks in the Dark. Uh, that's maybe uh, the next song title or something like that. But uh, anybody who've ever been been uh, too close with their tool holder to a fixture or something knows what I'm talking about. And then I think kind of like trying to wrap it up uh, in the end with the right post, the right tooling, uh, the right place uh, to to uh, to kind of like get get into to all of this. So over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, really trying to dig into some of these roadblocks you can run into when you're trying to run unattended. So, uh, like Derek said, my name is uh, Lars Christensen. I work at Autodesk. Maybe the only two really interesting things about me is I'm originally from Denmark. That's why there's a little bit of an accent there. Uh, and then I am a mold maker uh, of trade. Um, also, uh, maybe valuable is I'll share my email address with you here, uh, lars.christensen at autodesk.com. Um, and it, like before, like Derek said, please put all your questions, whatever, in the question area for the, so we can uh, chit chat about them at the end of the presentation. But you're definitely also more than welcome to uh, to shoot me an email uh, if if we kind of like want to discuss further about different things, uh, tips and tricks, and so. Um, also, if you are out on social, uh, definitely be happy with connecting with you out there. Uh, I have a YouTube channel where I talk a lot about CAD and CAM. I have a Facebook page where I give some tips and tricks and, you know, LinkedIn and, and all that uh, kind of stuff. So nobody really liked to, to date themselves, um, but I just thought that maybe it was important to, you know, when I started in industry, this was kind of like uh, the machines we used back then. Um, the first shop I worked in actually did not have a CNC machine. And this one here is actually pretty advanced. Um, for anybody who ever run one of these uh, Bridgeport type machines, this one actually has a digital readout on it. And the X axis can actually feed by itself. You only have to crack the handles on Y and Z. So that's kind of like where where I started out. And, you know, when we when I started working the first shop where there was a CNC mill, this goes back to like the early 90s. The CNC mills, we we only dared to really drill holes with it. Um, you know, there was no really swoopy contours or anything. We didn't really have the cam to, to drive that. Of course, a lot of that have changed. And uh, over the years, I have programmed uh, a bunch of different um, machines uh, out there. Um, you know, the, the Haas type with, with the A-axis on it. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, little bit later. I've also programmed some some few robo drills uh, and Kitamaras and these two here. The reason I brought these two up was uh, because they actually have pallet changes on them. So here you kind of start thinking about you know how can I how can I set up or how can I do things so the spindle is running while I'm setting up or do other things on on the secondary pallet. The one machine that I that I used to program that probably comes the closest to uh, unattended machining or lights out machining. I used to program a Matsura with a 11 uh, pallet pool 
on it. Uh, and it had about, I think, like 200 tools back in, in the tool changer. And, and, you know, when a shop buys a machine like this, like, I don't know, $700,000 machine, then you really start have to start thinking uh, about running unattended and, and how you kind of like want to get into uh, to that. Now, I'm not really going to, I don't really want to talk too much about that type of machine, but, um, you know, there is different machines out there that can do different things. The funny thing about the Matsura here with 11 pallet pool is that, uh, yes, you have 11 pallet, but you still only have one spindle. So there's still only one spindle making parts, uh, but it's just maybe off topic a little bit, but one of the things to consider when you're looking at machines like that. So this machine here is actually uh, our machine uh, at our facility at Pier 9 in San Francisco. So we have a machine shop out there uh, where we can do different things, testing and so forth. And uh, this is the VF2 we have out there. Now, uh, if you look at this one, uh, you can see that this one is pretty much powered down end of the work day. And that's what we're going to talk about today is more standard machines like Vertica mills or so. How can you, what should you do to kind of get into uh, to running these unattended? So, you know, not that you power down the machine, but you actually maybe just turn off the lights and the machine will actually be running. Um, this whole talk about unattended or lights uh, out was something that I got involved in uh, back in the early 2000s. Um, like maybe many of you guys, I, I worked at a tool and die shop slash job shop where uh, each person kind of like worked on their own project. Um, and, and that meant that if somebody had to use a mill, they would go over to a mill. Um, if they had to use a lathe, they would go over to a lathe. And the CNC mills were really treated like we used to do with the standard old time cranking handle mills, right? Like the bridge ports and so forth. And uh, it really meant that we never really got any much use out of the CNC machines past when there was a guy standing right in front of it running his pot that had about, uh, you know, maybe 20 minute cycle time or so. So we started experimenting about what do you need to do to be able to run your, your, your parts, get some extra time out of your machine. So, uh, you know, we are looking at, you know, if, if I can go home at five o'clock uh, and my machine can run three hours, four hours or five hours after I leave, that would be, you know, that's, that's money right there that, that, that can be made. Um, so the next, you know, half an hour or so, I wanna go through some of the, the tips and tricks on what you need to do. Um, one thing I will say is, though, if there's any shop owners uh, chiming in on, on, on this uh, presentation here, you know, you really need to get your people on board to do that. Like, you know, you can't just run out tomorrow morning and be like, okay, we're going to start running, running lights out. Uh, you know, that, then it will never really, really work. You really need to kind of like get a little bit of planning going. And, you know, one way to do this is kind of like, batch together, find out what parts on the shop floor that can be batched together, maybe would be a good fit to run uh, unattended. And, you know, one way to do it is breaking it down to say, you know, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we might stop a little bit earlier and then uh, get things running through, through the night. I don't really want to talk too much about this overhead unless you guys are putting it in the question uh, in the question area that is something we should talk about. Um, but we can definitely talk more in the end about that if you're interested. So just type it in there. Um, you know, I've actually had, you know, scenarios where customers would actually call and ask uh, if we could run unattended. So we can definitely talk uh, more about that. But um, today to doing this presentation, I am going to be using three different uh, cam uh, software today. Um, but if I do a good job, and uh, you be the judge, you put it in the question area or send me an email or whatever, uh, it shouldn't really matter what kind of software you're using uh, to do some of these things. If you're using Mastercam or Gipscam or, or other software, most software should have these functions in it that, that I'm going to be showing uh, today. But I'm going to be using uh, Inventor HSM that runs inside of Inventor, uh, HSM Works that runs right inside of SolidWorks, 
and then kind of like the latest uh, um, thing out there, and that is a Fusion uh, 360. But again, you know, like I said, if I do a decent job, then a lot of these tips and tricks will definitely, you know, work great for, for whatever uh, you, you are going to be doing. Uh, and I normally, when I do presentation, I normally get a question about pricing. And if you, I, def, I have a couple of slides that will show it. Uh, so if you guys are interested, definitely talk more about the cam end of it. But that's not the important thing here. So let's jump in and start talking about some of these things that you run into uh, when you are um, when you are, are talking about running unattended or lights out. So the, I just jump into Fusion 360 here. And maybe the first thing that is worth talking a little bit about is kind of like the layout of, of what you, you have. Now, of course, I'm, I'm inside of Fusion 360. I have what is called an integrated CAD and CAM. What means I have a full solid uh, modeler in here versus, uh, you know, standard 2D. And then I also have my CAM in here. But let me just kind of like quickly talk a little bit about the real estate. So what I have is I have the table. Uh, drawn up and this is a table that is kind of like appropriate to a VF3 Haas um, and you if we start from the left to the right here uh, I got a little tool probe over here to the left some of you guys may or may not have these um, and then I have these two vices here now I put a orange vice and a curd vice on here just because any of the shops that I worked in you know, we never had the same matching things. It was always a little bit different. But what I want to point out is that I do have those two vices sitting on kind of like a shop plate down here. Uh, what in this case here could be like a steel plate with a bunch of tapped holes in it. Um, and the purpose for that is that now you can load your vices up on that shop plate. And uh, it might take a couple of guys, but uh, you can take that shop plate off in the morning and now you have all this real estate where you can do your you know your quick small runs and then you know it gets to 4 4 30 in the afternoon you can quickly put this sub plate back on and device is already indicated in they could even have the parts preloaded in there um so it makes it a little bit easier to get in and start running this unattended um i have also so, so this plate here is a steel plate with a bunch of tapped holes in it, maybe it's been heat treated. I have also used like a 6061 aluminum plates <clears throat> where I would just face off the top right in the machine. And then I would literally drill and tap holes as I needed them in that sub plate, but can also be nice. Um, and, you know, after a while it looks like Swiss cheese, but, you know, it's, it's fairly cheap. So kind of like different uh, alternatives. And then over in the end here, I do have a uh, an A axis sitting over here. Um, and I definitely don't want to tell anybody that you have to go out and get an A axis to uh, to be able to, to, to do unattended machining. Uh, that's definitely not the case. But what it does give you is it gives you an, an opportunity to index. So what you can do is you can suddenly start attacking a part maybe from, from multiple sides uh, and, and make you know some of the work uh, a little little bit um, easier here. Now, uh, so just to go back and look a little bit on these vices here. So the first vice here is uh, this orange vice here, and that is what we call a dual station vice. So um, I have one part sitting in here, but the part has two operations in it. So the first operation, it kind of like machines the, the the backside here, and the second operation it machines uh, the, the, the second side, uh, the front side here. So of course, this is great if you have, you know, if you got to make more than one part, you can you can do this, this uh, setup right here. Then I also over here have um, a, a fixture plate. And this plate here might be machined out of something like uh, aluminum, uh, or something like that. And let me just go in here and uh, go in here and hide these parts maybe so we can look at the fixture uh, so this is one of the things that definitely you know uh, to, to consider is to to you know you can use the vise uh, like this with also putting fixtures in it not just clamping fixtures to the table but actually hold them in the vise and I'm using mighty bite clamps uh, in here I used to use a lot of mighty bite clamps I'm a big fan of mighty bite 
Um, these here are actually machinable. So you can actually go in and machine these surfaces here to get the right uh, radius uh, for these parts here. Um, now, of course, what is nice about this scenario here being inside of an integrated CAD and CAM system is that I can I can create the fixture around my part, and that's really one of the really nice uh, functions uh, that that I really was happier with uh, when I could could use that. Uh, you will also see here if we go over and look at the A axis over here. I also used a couple of mighty bytes uh, for this one over here. Actually, these mighty bytes they're called Unifors and I'm not endorsed by uh, <laughs> by Mighty Byte, but I'm so happy with them. Uh, these, are, I think that you're supposed to clamp two parts on each side. So these here, when you tighten the screw down, these will kind of like spread open. But I was so happy with these uniforms clamps that I would many times do what you see here. Just have a solid fixture here and then clamp uh, against uh, the part here. Now, one of the advantages about being inside of a solid model or also when we're talking about uh, working uh, unattended is you can design your fixturing around your parts. Uh, so as you can see, the layout that I have here with the whole table and the parts, it really gives me a very good visual on what's going to happen uh, out of the machine. Because, you know, as you guys could, could imagine, all these parts are not going to be running at the same uh, cycle, meaning that we might just need to make four of these parts over here and then that vice could simply go away while we're still running a bunch of these, right? Um, so having it inside of a solid model like this can be really, really helpful. Uh, another thing I just quickly want to show is also the advantage uh, about being inside of that, and then I'm going to stop talking about it, is it can give you uh, a way to work um, around customer changes. So this part here, it's actually a mold core for a race, uh, uh, race car's mirror. So for like a carbon uh, for that. So if I go in and I open up that part, and I don't know if I've ever tried a customer not making a design change to a part. If I go in here and I make a change to this part here, so let me just make this a little bit longer. So now this lip became a half inch longer here and I save that, you will actually see that when I go into my fixture assembly in here, I get flagged up here that there is a design change to the part. Well, what you will see is that when I click this button up here, this will actually get updated with, with the whole fixturing. So just like that, I don't know if you caught it, but it moved a half an inch out and everything in our fixturing moved along with it. I can show you that on the big one here too because it's going to do the same thing. So if you look, keeping an eye on this Uniforce clamp here, when I click this update here, you will actually see that this one's going to move out a half an inch. So the, the fixture design follows, uh, follows the, the part here. So that's one of the things that is really nice about working in this environment. Now, of course, if you already machined the fixture, you if then you, of course, you know, in a little bit of a trouble. But in the design process, you can design your fixtures around uh, customers' parts. All right, let's go in and I'll talk a little bit about work offsets. So I'm going to go over here and look at uh, and this little fixture plate that uh, I created here. Now, having everything laid out like this in in your in your CAD and CAM. You know, if I machine, if I set this raw block of aluminum in the vise, and I then machine the fixture and leave it in the vise, I should be pretty guaranteed that each part that I plug in here uh, should be right on location, right? So you can design <clears throat> your fixtures um, around that. Um, and whenever you can get away with that, that is definitely, you know, the best way to go with that. Now, if I go in here to my CAM module within Fusion 360, <clears throat> I have two operations already uh, programmed in here. So I have a roughing and I have a finishing operation. You can see it's just uh, only programming one part though. Now, one of the things you want to be aware of is that most software actually do have capabilities of kind of like taking one tool path and copy it onto more parts. So you don't have to worry about sitting here and picking each individual components. 
Because what we got to remember is that if we are trying to run these parts unattended, then we are probably sitting, you know, uh, at a different time than when we're going to run them. So, you know, it might be Wednesday morning, you're sitting here programming for something that is not going to run in the machine till Thursday evening. So the less clicks you have to do in here can definitely be, be, be huge. So I'm just going to go in here and just do a quick uh, generate the tool path here. And uh, what I can do in here is I can actually, what we call it pattern. And again, it depends on what software you have, but most of them have something like this. But what I can do is I can go in here and I can say I want to add, uh, add a pattern. So I program one part and literally I can go in and say program the rest. And it finds the remaining parts right in here in the design. Um, and now I have those parts all programmed. And now I, of course, can go in and I can simulate this. Um, and you will see that when I simulate this in here, I actually have one, the stock showing on this one here. But what you will see, if I turn it down a little bit, is that it will go ahead and it will machine each part and go around and machine each part um, individually here. And I can I can also adjust that by, by tool, if it had multiple tools, so it finished each tool at a time. You will also notice in here that I do have my tool holders displaying in here too, because simulation, when you're trying to prep for running unattended, is absolutely critical that you can sit at your desk and have a good view on what is going uh, to happen out at the machine. So this technique here will kind of like patterning one tool path around to the remaining parts that are similar is absolutely fantastic if you kind of like following this approach where you put the raw stock in a vise and then you machine the fixture uh, in the same setup as where you're going to machine the part. So whenever you can get away with that, then you definitely want to want to do that. Now, uh, but uh, sometimes that's not always possible or you might have some fixture wear uh, at some point where you actually want to be able to control each one individually. So, you know, sometimes you, 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 when you do your inspection, you find out that, you know, the sixth one is a little bit out of whack and you might want to shift it a little bit. And there, of course, we can use work offsets. Uh, and I would assume that most of you guys are somewhat familiar with work offsets, you know, G54, G55, G56 uh, on your machine. And if you if not, I would definitely recommend that you take a look at your machine manual and kind of like read up on it a little bit. Every machine is a little different on what they do, but they're fairly much following the same uh, rule here. So let me show you. I'm just gonna take those same two toolpaths I had before, and I'm just gonna drag them out of the pattern here. So uh, delete the pattern. So now we're back to where we were before. Um, what you can also do is you could assign a work offset to each one of these components so now you pick each part up or each pocket up and now right at the control you could actually shift your x y or z a little bit uh, for those uh, adjustments now to show you how you can do that um, we can actually do that right from within software so you actually don't have to uh, worry too much about like writing sub programs and so, so, uh, so forth now, I have eight parts, and I assume that most people are familiar with G54, G55, G56, up to G59. But if we were only using G54 to G59, we would only get to this part here. We will leave the rest out here. Most machines actually have additional work offset. Uh, depending on the machine, uh, like the standard for knock control, it's a G54 Point 0.1 P1, that will be the first one. P2 will be the second one and so forth. So you actually have a lot more work offsets on your machine generally than just G54 to G59. Uh, and we can utilize those for something like this here. So if I go in and I go into my, my um, setup here, I can actually control my work offset of what I want out in my G code. So right now it's set to one, what means G54. If you're looking over here, you'll see I get like a triad showing up on the screen, uh, showing me that this is where this part is picked up right in the center of this part. 
But you will see over here, I can actually turn on multiple work offsets. So I have eight parts. So I can say I want eight parts and I want to change the work offset by one value. But in my case, I don't want to start at G54 because then, like I said, G59 would be here and then what after. But if I go in and I change this to seven, then it would actually start at G54.1 P1. This would be G54.1 P2 and so forth. Let me show you. And I can ch choose to preserve the order, whatever I want. So I'm just going to click on this here and regenerate uh, my tool path. And then I'm just going to post out the code so we can take a look at the code here. So let me just hit the post. Um, I'm going to talk about post a little bit later, but this is all the posts that ships with Fusion uh, 360. Actually, that's the same one for all our uh, posts here. Um, so I'm going to select a generic Fanuc post. So most people are probably familiar with that code. Let me just uh, post that out here. So this is what really matters, right? I mean, all the other things are really just leading up to code is what the machine needs to run on. Now, what you will see here is that the first call out is now a G51 point, G54.1 P1, what is the first in the upper left corner. And if I scroll down here, you will see that the next one down here is going to be a G54.1 P2. So that's the one to the right of it. And so forth, if we look at this whole code, we have now posted out, whoops, we've now posted out those eight operations uh, for this. And we should end up at, uh, at G54.1 P8, right? Because we had eight parts. So definitely make sure that you keep track of, uh, of these uh, work offset and be aware of you can utilize those uh, for this uh, type of operations here. Okay, uh, let's jump over to Inventor uh, HSM quickly here. So I kind of like have the, the same layout uh, as uh, you just saw. Um, and what I want to talk about here is um, one of the, the, the nice things uh, <laughs> when you're trying to do this unattended, and that is uh, some collision detection. So we're going to look at these other parts we have in the dual vice over here. So let me just zoom in on that. So this is this is a one part uh, where this is the, the bottom and this is the, 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 the top here. So it's going to be like one and, and two uh, sitting right in here. Now I'm going to go ahead and switch over to uh, my camera over here. And I've already programmed uh, kind of like the first part sitting uh, right here. Um, and uh, when I go ahead and I simulate this, just to show you what we got here, if I uh, hit the play button, you will see that we kind of like can see we are, we, are, we are facing off the part and you will see that um, I'm, I'm going ahead and I'm spot drilling uh, and then I'm doing some drilling, some tapping uh, and so forth. Um, and then I'm actually, I'm machining this hole through here that is going to be my pickup for the other part over here. And then I'm machining around the part at the end. Now, that's what I want to show you. So if I go in here, uh, what we have is we're going to be machining this uh, hole right through the center because we're going to pick that up in the second operation. But when I machine around the part here, um, if I just simulate that by itself, you'll see that the cutter's going to cut uh, around the part here. Now, one of the questions you might have is how deep are you going to machine? Um, if I go in and edit this, you might be tempted to say that, well, I'm going to just uh, machine this to the depth of the model itself. So if I go in and change this to model bottom and click OK, and I now go in and simulate that, you will actually see that down at the bottom here, I actually get some red flags because what actually happens here is that you will see my tool actually turns red because it would collide with my vise. Um, let me play that again so you can see it. See how the tool turns red? 
And, you know, if we did this in, in real life, this would be terrible, right? Sparks would be flying, you know, sparks, no sparks in the dark here. Um, so be aware of that your, your, your CAM software can actually put this collision detection, all, not just, you know, are you, are you crashing into the part, but also if the tool is crashing into uh, to fixturing. So that's extremely uh, important. Now, again, the nice thing about being inside of having everything laid out here is that I can actually use that jaw here as my kind of target depth. Uh, so if I go in here, I can change this to selection. And if I select the top of this jaw, I can actually add like another 50,000 uh, just to be safe. And now you will see that when I simulate around here that it will, um, it will not turn red. It's not hitting the jaw anymore, right? It's, it's, it's safe from that. So just be aware of that, you know, we have these collision detections, not just, you know, most people are thinking about the end mill uh, you know, rabbiting across without going up in the sea and crashing into your part. But you can also use this for your vice jaws, for your clamping, uh, and so forth. Now, another thing I wanted to show is the other part sitting, uh, the second part here. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about picking that part up. Um, because most of the times uh, when we're picking parts up, we're thinking about picking up maybe the outside uh, of a part. Um, but you can actually use, if you have like spindle probes, you can use those to pick up your parts. And you might already be, be aware of that, but you can actually use them to pick up your part in the middle of your, your tool path operations. What I mean by that is, Right, you saw how in the first operation I machined this hole all the way through. Well, maybe I didn't have, you know, I couldn't machine all the way through the stock. I could only machine maybe 10 thousands past the hole and there was still additional stock sitting on top of this part that I would have to face off before that hole would appear. Uh, what would you do then? Well, many people would then say, well, let's just pick up the outside instead. Um, but the problem many times is that uh, tolerances on the outside are made many times fairly loose compared to uh, what you have on the inside hole. So now you are trying to keep a very tight tolerance on the outside because that's what you're going to be using. But you could actually instead um, do a tool operation and then use probing to reset your work offset. So let me show you. Uh, if we're going to say that we're using G54 for the first operation, we might choose to use uh, G55 for the, for the second operation. But what I can do is I can insert a probing operation. So I'm going to insert a probing operation right here. And I'm just going to select that this is the hole uh, that I want to probe. And then you will see that that probing, oops, I'm going to do it on the other setup. Try that again, probing. And I'm gonna pick up this hole here. So now I have this probing sitting down here. Now, it's sitting at the end of the feature, which means it's the last thing, but I can actually just take it and I can kind of like drag it up. So now what I can do is I can have a facing operation where I clean up the top, where we make this hole appear in the middle of my program. Think about that then it's going to call up a probing operation that will actually go in and reset my G55 to exactly where that hole is before it machines the rest of this part. So if I go in and simulate this quick, we will see that we are getting a facing operation that's just going to check deck off the top. And then when I've done that, you will see the probing is going to come in and reprobe the hole and when it does that, it's going to reset the G54 right on the machine. So now the remaining operations uh, are going to be dead accurate to that hole. So again, you know, it's kind of like where, you know, some of the things you can do. And if I post this out, uh, let's go and post that out. And this time I just select the generic Haas post.
you will see here that in the beginning, uh, you, you will call up the facing operation. Um, and actually, I did it for G54. Uh, and then the probe calls up here. It's going to call up the probe in T6. It's going to call up the G54, but then it's going to reset it uh, in here after the probe runs. So the next toolpath, the G54 would have been adjusted to that hole. Really cool stuff uh, that, that we have available. Now, talking about um, tools and, 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 and tool probes, and like I said before, I have this other probe sitting over here to the, to the left here. Um, if we just go in and look at uh, tool libraries or the tools you're going to be using here, um, I actually have a tool library that I call Night Tools. And I would recommend you do the same thing as you kind of like getting into doing some of this stuff. Um, and, and the reason I'm talking about Night Tools is you know, when you're running your CNC machine, you normally are pushing hard, right? I hope. You know, you're pushing your end mills, better chip load, and so forth. Now, when you're working at the machines that's running at night, at night or unattended, you actually you can actually back off a little uh, on something like your chip load and make sure that, uh, you know, you don't uh, uh, are breaking end mills and so forth by pushing too hard. Now you have a little bit of lead time, right? If you, you're turning the, the lights off and go home and now the machine is running another three, four, five hours uh, doing all these different operations, you don't really care if the chip load is a little slower. Another thing I, I have in here, if we go in and look at the tools, I have my night tool set to break control. What means that after each tool have run, it's gonna go over to the tool probe on the table and it's gonna it's gonna check that to make sure that there is no uh, breakage in there. Um, so that's definitely something else that is really great to have. And that have saved me a few times, you know, especially like you're drilling and tapping, that your drill, if your drill breaks or your drill gets pushed up in the collet, uh, you don't wanna run your tab, it's gonna break. Well, that probe over there uh, can detect that. Last thing I just wanna, want to show here and again put your questions in the common area and we will we will we will chat more about it but I want to make sure we get to those let me jump into SolidWorks here as my my last uh, example so what we have covered here is first of all having things laid out work offset uh, using probing if you have it available working with your work offsets and collision control but you can actually also use not just if you're hitting the fixture but actually also have your tools know how they are compared to the parts. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. If uh, I zoom in over here on this fourth axis, and uh, I'm just gonna let the screen update here. I have a lot of cam running, different programs running, so I might just slack a little bit. I'm just gonna go on a side view here so we can take uh, a little bit of closer look. All right, um, that should do it. So we're looking at the side of this mirror core here. I have one toolpath prepared, and if you look at that toolpath, you can kind of like see how the toolpath uh, looks here, um, kind of like stepping down, right? Now, um, if I go in and I simulate this tool with the stock on it, and let me just turn my simulation speed down a little bit. Many times we try to run with as stoppy as tooling as we can, right? Because the longer our tools are hanging out, vibrations, we don't want that. But what can happen here, if I hit the play button, you will see that it's gonna machine around this part here um, you will see that I'm going to run into a problem with uh, the tool holder and this tool here. Um, it is actually going to, I'm going to speed it up a little bit more. You can actually see here on the screen that it's actually the tool holder is going to collide with the part. Um, and, you know, like I said before, simulation is your key when you're trying to run uh, unattended. Um, but we actually have some tools that can help you with that. But it's pretty neat. If I go out of this simulation here and go back into my operation, 
um, I can actually turn on something called shaft and holder protection uh, in the menu. And what that would let me do is it would let me set an interference with, um, with my tool or with my tool holder. So it, it, right now the software is saying I got to keep at least 200 thousands away my tool holder to my, my part. And this is why it's critical to have your tool holders in there when you're simulating. Now I got some different options. I can actually tell the tool to back away. So if I do that, you will actually see that the standard tool path, it will now kind of like move away from the part to ensure that the tool holder don't hit. Now, of course, that means I have more material to remove in later operations, um, but it saves me from ruining my parts, of course. Now, the other option here is actually pretty neat. It's called Detect Tool Length. So if I use that and I hit OK, you will actually see that I'm going to get a warning on my tool path here. And if I right click on it and I say show lock, it says warning, the tool link has been updated from one inch to 1.96, some almost two inches to ensure that the holder doesn't collide with the part. So what the software here have done is that it has actually um, gone ahead and help me by saying you can't run this part with this stoppy tool like this uh, and you will see that now I get the tool hanging out a lot longer uh, and I don't have any collisions uh, when I am doing this um, and if I go in and I look at the tool itself you will see that I now have that length uh, have been changed in here for the length of this cutter automatically um, by by the, the, the software here. Uh, so pretty cool. All right. Um, want to wrap it up here. The last thing I just want to talk about that I think is, is critical. I hope all this, of course, is helpful. I wanted to talk a little bit about post processors um, because this is critical. And, and I remember when I when I had that moment on the shop floor where I kind of like had a little <laughs> uh, talk to myself where I said, you know what? Uh, I have run this post multiple times. I know there's no funky moves in there. I should be fine to start running unattended. And, and I was. Um, I'm a, a believer that uh, you should not have to go in and hand edit your posts. You should, on day-to-day on -day stuff, you should be able to program it in your cam software, whatever you're using, hit the post button, uh, and it should, uh, it should give you code that you can run without having to go in and change things uh, to avoid a crash. And when it comes to run unattended, you definitely need to, to have that happen. Um, so you might have to do some testing on your end if you, if you want to, to kind of like make sure that, that that's where your post is but you cannot take any chances uh, with that. Uh, we at Autodesk, we actually have uh, a post website uh, where we have a post team that create post processors for all different kinds of machines. This one is updated daily uh, with new tweaks and things like that for posts. So not just the post you saw in, um, not just the post you saw in the software when I posted things out, but actually most out on the web. So if you, if you type in in Google Cam Autodesk Post, you will get right to that website I just showed you. But that's extremely important in the end that I say that. Your post processor has to be dialed in and be, um, be trusted, right? So just to kind of like wrap things up, um, I hope this was helpful. So definitely, you know, it's a process. You got If you haven't done unattended machining before, definitely play a, play a little bit around with how you can lay things out on your table to get more out real estate out of, of your area out there. Uh, come up with some, some fixture designs, uh, play around with different ways to hold parts, either if it's just in a vise or create fixtures inside a vise. And if you have any good ideas uh, that is better than, you know, uh, that you want to share, I would love to get uh, your email. Work with your work offsets. You have multiple work offsets on your machine. You can really use those to your advantage. So if you go back to that uh, image before, uh, you know, you can have all these pro was programmed uh, with the G54.1P one, 
Uh, this one could be G54. This other part in the second in the device could be G55, G56. Actually, on the A axis, I would probably have my work offset right in the center rotation and program everything from there, but that's another discussion. Um, if you do have uh, these tooling probes, uh, definitely utilize them not just when you're setting up your, if your machine have them, not just using them to set up your tools or to pick up your part, but you can actually also use it to check your tools, doing programming and even change work offsets doing your machining too, what is pretty cool. And then use those collisions uh, detections that is inside of your software, collision detection with your vices, with your fixtures, but also with your parts. And if you're if you're lucky enough, uh, like uh, inside of um, um, inside of Inventor HSM SolidWorks or HSM Works or Fusion 360, where you can actually have the tool moving away from the part, also, you definitely gotta uh, utilize uh, those tools. So with that. Uh, that was kind of like what I had prepared here. We're hitting the 47 uh, minute mark here. Again, here is my uh, email address. Definitely, I would love to get your feedback. What do you think of the presentation? I really hope that it was it was it was worth your, your time. Uh, and also, of course, cam.autodesk.com. Uh, you know, you can learn more about uh, these uh, different solutions.